All right, the market ended Friday and the week flat after bouts of heavy volatility. However, the Indian equities turned into foreign money magnets once again with $7 billion coming in during July and August. We discuss all of that and more on your favorite weekend show, The Editor's Roundtable. I'm Sonia Shanoi and with me is Prashant Nair, Anand Singhal, Mangala Malu. Folks, uh, I don't know about you guys, but nerves were all over the place this week. One very good day, one bad day, one okay day. And I don't know what was happening. And one holiday. <laughs> which was, which was supposed to be the worst day, right? Yeah. Uh, when the market was shut and the SGX Nifty was down 300 points. Yeah. Uh, you know, you how rarely is this possible? You know, the, the Nifty ended with, I think, five or six point move for the week. The Sensex, I think, for the week was absolutely flat uh, after the last 30-minute move. Uh, uh, and after so much happening, you know, it's like, you know, one of those tiring markets once again making yeah. a bit of a comeback. Yeah. Uh, and just when, you know, both intraday and weekly-wise, just when you think the market's making a move, opposite direction, you yeah. know, takes over. And, and on really Tuesday, that. the market was on steroids, right? We were discussing what's you know, happening the, here. The, my takeaway is that never look at SGX Nifty on holidays. <laughs> Don't look at it on, I mean, you know, there's no point, right? Saturday, Sundays, I mean, can do anything, but Monday morning or, I mean, the next day after the holiday, uh, it could be some, something completely different is what you said, because yeah. there was a 300 point downtick on that, on the holiday. And then it was nothing. I mean, uh, you know, you know hmm. since you mentioned SGX Nifty, this is something I always say that you know you should never look at SGX Nifty. Yeah. I know there's this there's this Hindi saying that I have. Jine parva hai kal ki wo roenge raat bhar. Jo jeete hain aaj mein wo soenge raat bhar. It doesn't matter. You know what SGX Nifty does in the night. You come back next morning and trade. So uh, you know yeah. you're in quite a shairana mood. So to say. But uh, you know, I if Anuj wasn't an anchor, yeah. he would have definitely been in Bollywood. The, yeah, yeah. Uh, the kind of you know the, the way he. Plays. Sure, if I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> but Behind the camera, man. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, we'll talk about Bollywood is not doing well. This no, time mean to me is over for the year yeah. already. You remember the opening yeah. episode? I think uh, it was over that day. Uh, Mangal, so, what about you? No, no, so I was just looking at the way uh, the markets have moved, etc. Uh, you know, it, it reminds me of a cricket match where you look at the score and you'd be like, okay, it was a tie. But what? it's only the people who watched that match will know the emotions through which every player, the viewers, all of them went. For the record books, yes, five or six points move for this week. Everyone will be like, okay, this is a blip. But at the lows, Nifty was what? 17,150 or 166 odd and at the highs it was 17,700 so that's 600 point yeah. move for virtually nothing so that was the emotions it, it, it those who were involved would know exactly what how the week, week was oh absolutely uh, so let's stack up the numbers right I mean uh, FIIs were money magnets as yeah. uh, as we were just referring to it but how do the numbers look this time yeah you know uh, Sonia pictures still story better so let me just go across to the wall and I think uh, the graphics would come up for you and uh, just uh, go through that uh, because uh, this was the week in which there were some very interesting data points which came through. Short bets in US. Remember, we had discussed this two or three back, a week back as, uh, as well, that what's happening over there. Now, look at this. Post-COVID, this is the kind of short bets that hedge funds had on the US market. 300,000 net short contracts on the S&P 500. After that, of course, you had seen that rally. And then this was a phase, which the golden phase in which you had that, that massive rally. And then the market became extremely overbought. And now look at what's happening. We are once again back down to almost the pre-COVID level, or the, the COVID level short positions in the market. Now, you know, these shorts have just increased as the market has declined. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. What do these shorts know? Or are they just in, you know, believing that the market rally is over? There's another indicator. This is a Invesco QQQ ETF. This ETF is basically nothing, but it tracks inflows and outflows into the Nasdaq listed big tech companies. Over the last 15 days, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the kind of short bets which have been taken, let's get back to the previous graphic, uh, uh, the, the short, short bets which have been taken on that is $5.4 billion, which has taken to the total short bet to $25 billion. This is the data courtesy of Wall Street Journal report. Uh, uh, so that's the humongous data. The other point that uh, I was looking at the global market from the global market point of view is what's happening in the bond market. And this graph is, is fascinating because for the first time since 1980, the global bond market is in a bear market, which, which means that the draw drawdown from the top is 20%. Equities go through the bear market, right? But this is the first time that the bond markets have gone through a bear market. First time since 1980. What is the significance of 1980, by the way, guys? None of you were born, <laughs> except me. So, 
<laughs> just tells you the the enormity of the kind of bear market that we have in the bond markets. Uh, and one final data point. Now let's look at the Indian market as well. Uh, uh, you know, in the Indian market, uh, okay, uh, uh, let's first revisit this uh, because what this means is that. Uh, the Fed will increase rates by another 75 basis points. Now you ask me, why is that a problem? The market's been factoring in 75 basis point rate hike in the last two meetings as well. What difference does it make if we have another 75 basis point? Because we don't know if this is the last 75 basis point. You know, I don't want to go into the 80s when the Fed rates <laughs> peaked at 20%, mm. but the fear factor is back. Mm. Now in India, the FIs are now on the short side, 73% on the short side, the net shorts at 60,500 contracts, which is uh, shorts minus uh, longs. At the recent highs, FIs were long by about 20,000 contracts. Now, this is where the picture is really getting fascinating. Shorts normally help markets if the markets turn. But for the markets to turn, there has to be some kind of a catalyst. Now, where that catalyst is going to come from, I don't know, but the market is positioned on the short side after a really long time, which for me is fascinating. Okay, it's fascinating. And you know, that brings us to the next question, right? If the US market is going to underperform, say it's going into a recession, in any case, since Powell's speech, the US markets are down 7%. Do we benefit from that? I mean, does is India going to decouple from the U.S. markets, which has, I, I think it's playing out. I mean, India has been resilient so far. And uh, by the way, Anush, you know, you trolled yourself. I mean, I was trolling you so far, but now you took over the baton you know, and you trolled okay, yourself. Because, you know, I'm, I believe, you know, you should laugh at yourself. Right? You know, <laughs> I wasn't laughing at someone else. So, <laughs> I, I wasn't born in 1980, but I do remember the, uh, the interest rates from uh, B-School. We had read about uh, Paul Walker, also known as Tall Walker, because he was extremely tall. And then there was this graphic which said that the uh, the, the interest case. rates uh, are well, the height the, of the Fed exactly. chairman. The Fed yeah. chairman, yeah. yeah and Janet Yellen was the Janet. shortest, and yeah. uh, the interest rates were near zero. Uh, we've you all are, seen you that. You are 90s kid, right? I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I still know tall. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I mean, uh, you know, Prashant, that was the big uh, narrative, right? Yeah. That <clears throat> India could India get more flows, outsized flows, over the rest of the year, uh, purely because of how much pain there is across the US, across Europe and China? I think it could. I mean, that's the short answer, answer, but for the long answer, let me go across to the wall. Uh, and I'll tell you why uh, this is uh, such an important point to make at this point in time. Uh, so, you know, let me just, uh, so this is the question, right? Could India, I mean, you could put a question mark here, not put a question mark, but India structurally higher FII allocation, is it possible, uh, right? Now, just a quick bit. This is what they've done recently, what FIs have done recently between October 2021 and June 2022. They sold $33 billion. Now they've bought back $7 billion or so of that amount. All right. What is the big uh, sort of, you know, talk which is going on? This is it. Uh, and, and I put this in uh, sort of quotation marks. India deserves higher FII allocation. This is the growing chatter that foreign allocation to India should rise materially. Let's explore this argument which many people are making. To do this, let's just understand where uh, uh, sort of India gets most of its foreign money or rather what route does this money come in from. 96% uh, of the foreign money which comes into India, uh, sorry, 94% of the foreign money which comes into India comes not into India dedicated fl uh, funds, but it comes in what are called emerging market funds, global emerging market funds, of which India is a part. You know, India dedicated funds, active and passive, is only about 6%. The rest of the 94% comes through non-India dedicated active and passive funds, ETF. So 94%, now remember this number. Uh, how do these uh, sort of funds tra uh, allocate uh, to different uh, different markets? So, I mean, you know, somebody in the U.S. gives money to a global emerging market fund. They will invest uh, money in various emerging markets according to benchmarks. MSCI emerging market is one such benchmark. India's weight right now is 12.7%. The big market, of course, is uh, China at about 31.2%. Uh, so, again, I'll come back to this table because this is also important. Why are FII flows... Uh, suffering. Now, this is one argument which many have made, uh, and we've explored this as well. Uh, rem uh, uh, mind you, uh, remember that. Remember the fact that we are a we are part of the emerging market basket. So, when money comes into the emerging market fund, India gets its share. But what happens when money into emerging market dries up? And why has it dried up? Because of these reasons. Look at other constituents in terms of other countries. China is hurting because of zero COVID policy, crackdown on business, geopolitics. Taiwan, of course, at the center of a battle between big powers. 
South Korea, which is another big market, I mean, it could actually move out of the emerging market index and go into the developed market index, could happen as early as 12 to 18 months. The Brazilian economic prospects have dropped sharply. They've take, taken a turn for the right. Uh, Saudi Arabia is arguably one stock market, Saudi Aramco, right? And there, there are ESG concerns, etc. And South Africa is perceived as a low opportunity market broadly. Uh, Russia, of course, is now out of the MSCI index, is uninvestable. These are the countries along which uh, uh, this is the space that India shares in the emerging market basket. So when people find opportunities in all other all these other emerging markets low, they don't put money into emerging markets, and India also suffers because we get a portion of that according to the MSCI weightage. Uh, why, why, what are the other reasons why India uh, is different? Let's look at the historical record. Let's just go back. The 10-year CAGR dollar returns for India is 7.8 percent. This is, this is the figure. I mean, you know, South Africa, Brazil are negative, and look at the other returns. Look at growth forecasts for 2023. Top of the list, India is at about 7.27. The other, uh, others are far behind. China at about 5.2 comes the closest. So both in terms of historical stock returns and future growth prospects, economic prospects, India is right up there. Hence this question, are, does India deserve structurally higher FII allocations? What I understand after speaking to a foreign funds, etc., is big investment boards are capping their investments into China, uh, so they don't. They, they want to limit. They want to cap it uh, and not uh, very big money. Some big asset allocators have started giving mandates for emerging markets, ex-China, right? This is important. Uh, the big question, though, is will China continue to sort of hurtle lower, and we, maybe we will know in, in October uh, once uh, you know whether President Xi gets his third term, he becomes president for life, those kind of things, will they loosen up, become business friendly once again, zero COVID policy goes, we don't know, those are all what ifs. Uh, the feedback is that a lot more money could come into India if not for very high valuations. People want to come into the market big time. Uh, so structurally higher FI allocation all told is possible, but it's a process, it's not a one-time shift. It's not that people stop allocating to every other emerging market and put money uh, into India. This is, I mean, just uh, uh, imagining if China's weight goes to zero. This is not going to happen, but if there was a G uh, emerging market fund X china what would the weights look like? I'm just going to focus on India. India's weight right now is 12.7, but if China goes to zero, India's weight goes straight up to 18.5%. So this is, I mean, a big what if. But I, I think, uh, you know, as I said, structurally, I think we are on the right path in terms of higher FI allocations on a, on a permanent structural basis and not a one-time thing. Back to you guys. Okay, thanks a lot Prashant for that. So Prashant and Anuj went over to the wall and where are you going? I'm going to the mall <laughs> because <laughs> the other big story that we're tracking this time around on Monday, of course, you know, while we're talking about so many events that took place in the market, the volatility, etc., there was also the big Reliance AGM that happened. And the biggest takeaway for me from that AGM was Reliance finally entering officially into the FMCG yes. space. And that's important primarily because one, uh, you know, Reliance has already been selling a lot of the FMCG daily need products uh, via its own brands. We had, uh, you know, Thirsty Tail, we had something like Snack Tack, etc. But now it's also gone ahead and acquired Campa Cola, Socio. These are brands that you all would know from the yeah. 70s and 80s, <laughs> not you. Uh, but, you know, uh, these are brands that they're planning to bring back into the fold of the consumers. Why this is important is because if in recent times any of y'all would have gone to Costco, y'all would have seen the ubiquity of Costco's own brand, which is Kirkland, in their stores. They are nearly 31% of their overall sales. That amounts to $60 billion. Reliance wow. Retail does 2.5 lakh, 2.2 lakh crore worth sales. Even if they do 3 to 5% of the overall retail sales in their own FMCG brand, that would mean 7,000 to 11,000 crore worth sales. And that would put Reliance's FMCG brand into the top 10 FMCG companies. And what if they do 10% of their uh, sales from their FMCG brand? That would cross 20,000 crores, 22,000 crores to be precise. And that would make it the second biggest FMCG country, uh, company in the country after HUL, which does 55,000 crores. So wow. those are the kind of uh, numbers that we're talking about at scale. 
my sense is that this would have happened primarily because you see the valuations at which FMCG companies trade and Reliance retail has always been the value driver or valuation driver for Reliance and in that now they're trying to extract further value from yeah. the FMCG business and which is why Mukesh Ambani also said that you know he's confident that uh, you know this will be the biggest piece in their overall group uh, scheme of things. You know, Campa Cola was once India's largest selling yep. drink. This is when Moraji Desai shut shop on Coke. Coke and was made to move out of India. That's correct. And that's when Campa Cola was India's number one drink. And then came P.V. Nassim Arao's uh, liberalization policy, which really, I mean, uh, per perhaps was the turning point for India, right? Uh, uh, the best prime minister India has ever had. Mm. You know, really opening up the economy with Manmohan Singh. Coke made a comeback. I've got a camp of a bottle right on my desk. Okay. I can't go to get it. <laughs> just, just one bit trivia. <laughs> you know, you know, the brand Socio, which is very popular in Gujarat, was actually a government-owned organization mm. and they wanted to make the brand called Socio. Yeah. And because it was Gujarat, they made it Socio and it's doing very, really well. Okay. okay. Let's now talk about uh, the big trends in the auto space. Sir. Okay, so, so yeah. Reliance is not in the auto space so far. <laughs> <laughs> but you never know, right? So since we're talking about the auto industry, I mean, this time there are three big trends that I'm spotting in autos for the month of August. In case you missed out on all the numbers, uh, the first big trend is that commercial vehicle growth has slowed down quite a bit. Uh, it could be because the base effect has worn off. It could also be because in the monsoons, generally people don't buy too many uh, fresh vehicles. They buy pre-used, uh, you know, there are pre-sale vehicles. But overall, uh, if you look at it, it's a single-digit, low single-digit growth. Tata Motors barely saw six percent growth. Uh, Aisha Motors was just a 4.4% growth. So that's the first big trend. The other big trend is that two-wheeler exports are under a lot of pressure and that big, brings us back to that discussion about how India could benefit more from you know others because there's a big slowdown underway across the globe. So look at it. Hero Motor exports down 50%, Bajaj Auto down 30% and TVS was down almost 15%. And the last big trend is that there's a strong, strong revival in the passenger vehicle segment, perhaps because of new launches, because of a big order backlog as well as the supply side situation easing. Maruti went up almost 30%. M&M Auto sales were the best of the lot by a big margin, almost a 90% gain. And Tata Motors, because of the Tata Motors Nexon, uh, did exceptionally well too. So that is the update as far as the uh, auto space is concerned. But on that note, it's time for us to take a quick break on Editor's Roundtable. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back in just a bit. Welcome back to Editor's Roundtable. We have a guest joining us now. Harsha Upadhyay is uh, CIO Equity at Kotak Mutual Fund. Uh, Harsha, good evening. Thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, uh, what did you make of the kind of volatility? I, I would say the kind of violence that we had in the market, ending the week flat, but within that, there were so many moves. Good evening, Anuj. Uh, you are right. Uh, I think the volatility is here to stay. Uh, there are many macro headwinds, as uh, we have discussed in the past. Uh, uh, which which are in front of uh, everyone's eyes. So to that extent, I think every now and then you will see uh, choppiness in the market. And also the fact that uh, the latest up move that we saw in the market was uh, entirely liquidity driven and uh, based on valuation expansion rather than other things upgrades. So to that extent, at every higher level, there will be some nervousness and some profit booking, I guess. So I think uh, one should be uh, ready for that kind of volatility even going back. Uh, uh Harsha, uh, Harsha, the uh, uh, you know the view from Kotak has been cautious uh, for for some time now, right? About almost one and a half uh, one and a half months or so. Uh, with Nilesh with us, uh, he, he, others as well. You've sounded cautious as well. Do you have a view that maybe markets need to uh, settle slightly lower at an aggregate level? Um, not exactly. I mean, if it goes down and uh, it gives an opportunity to investors to enter at uh, lower valuation levels, then it will be good. But I think even if it consolidates at around current levels for some more time uh, until we start seeing uh, some kind of stability in earnings, uh, that will be good for markets. Because if you look back and see where markets were in the month of June, it was around 15,000 to 15,500 Nifty. And at that point of time, the valuations were uh, uh, lower than fair uh, range of valuations on a long term basis. But with the sharp 15% up move that we have seen, uh, which has not been supported by earnings upgrades, uh, in fact, there has been a marginal downgrade during the June quarter earnings season. Uh, given that valuations have actually moved uh, again back over the uh, fair uh, range of uh, valuation. So to that extent, I would say that uh, a bit of consolidation would help the markets. 
Uh, Harsha, good evening and thanks for joining in. So the domestic market has picked up in a big way, right? I mean, uh, I, I just looked at the Ganpati celebrations this time around and the mammoth scale at which it happened. One just wonders how the festive season will pan out as we head into Diwali. Uh, people are just out there traveling, shopping. Uh, do you think that this whole basket, whether it's autos, whether it's consumption, FMCG, you think you'll continue to see outsized gains for the rest of the year? Uh, in terms of demand, we clearly believe that the festive season is going to be very, very strong uh, across the board, whether it's discretionary, non-discretionary. But in terms of uh, stock performance, uh, we we are more positive on autos, for example, uh, where uh, there has not been much of a performance for the last several years uh, for various reasons. And now uh, everything seems to be falling in place for that sector. And uh, the ownership is also not as high as what we would have seen uh, historically for the auto sector. Uh, given all this and the fact that uh, valuations are reasonable, uh, we, we should see uh, this sector outperform. Uh, while consumer durables could also uh, have, have very good demand uh, coming in the festive season, but uh, valuations are not as supportive as uh, that would be for uh, auto, for example. So to that extent, uh, one has to uh, look at it in a, in a different way. Right. You know, taking uh, Sonia's point further, you know, while people are celebrating, uh, consuming a lot, etc., what they're not doing, Harsha, is going to the movies. Because I was just looking at some data. July box office collections were 270 crores, the paltry 270 crores. And in August, that number was half. Pre-pandemic, 40% of Bollywood movies were a success. And that number post-pandemic is just 7%. PVR Inox, uh, while they've rallied from the lows, from the highs, they've corrected just around 15 20%. What are your thoughts on these stocks? Uh, Mangalam, clearly, I think there has been a change in uh, uh, viewer behavior. I think people have preferred to watch it on devices, on OTT mm. platforms, rather than actually going to the movie theaters. Maybe a little bit of uh, still hesitation because uh, COVID is still around and uh, people are not comfortable going in uh, crowded areas, etc. Uh, there could be multiple reasons. But clearly, I think uh, the traditional uh, uh, theater business uh, has taken a hit. We'll have to wait and watch whether uh, it's a completely structural one or it's just a cyclical blip because of uh, the COVID and other factors. Uh, over the next few quarters, I think uh, we'll, we'll see clear signs about uh, one way or the other. Okay. Uh, now, Harsha, one thing which stands out is that uh, despite the kind of volatility in the market and especially the global market, the Mid-cap market is doing remarkably well. It's been quite resilient. Uh, do you get a bit nervous looking at the way some of these stocks have started to move off late? Uh, some of the B-group stocks and maybe even lower quality stocks, the, the way they move, moved this, this week, does that, does that make you nervous or do you think it's par for the course? Anuj, it always happens, right? Uh, whenever markets uh, start to move up, you will see uh, some of the lower rung stocks, uh, whether in mid caps or in small caps, also tend to move up. Uh, all of them may not have fundamental backing, but uh, they do move up quite significantly in those periods. So one has to be cautious, especially after seeing 15% kind of a sharp up move. One has to really focus on uh, companies which have a reasonable strength in terms of earnings, in terms of uh, going forward, how uh, they will pan out. Uh, and, and where the valuations are. I think uh, you can't really uh, look at uh, mid caps or small caps as a homogeneous basket and uh, take those calls. You will have to look at each business, evaluate, and then uh, make your portfolio. And, and uh, that's what uh, will, will help. Okay, Harsha, we have run out of time, but thanks a lot for stopping by and speaking to us on this edition of Editor's Roundtable. With that, it's a wrap, but you know what? I was just thinking, listening to Harsha saying that viewer behavior is changing. Yeah. Of course, I've been sitting at home. I haven't gone to a theater, but there's a movie coming up next week, right? Brahmastra. Brahma, I'm, excited, I'm for excited for that. I'm excited for that. But that's next weekend. What about this weekend? This weekend, this weekend there's so beast. much sporting action lined up. Yeah. You know, there's US Open going on. And on Sunday, I'm telling you this United versus Arsenal. It is. So, you know. <laughs> so, you know, my husband has already told me on Sunday, there's nowhere we're going. Those two, three hours, we're going to be sit in, sitting right in front of the television. So, you our know, Sunday's you know, cut out. Uh, the, Sonia keeps telling me about trolling and all, and how, you know, at times we are mean to each other. <laughs> the meanest thing I had done was I'd gone to Sonia's home in a, uh, for a party wearing United shirt. Uh, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and he was allowed in, by the way. He was allowed in. So, that, that is uh, as mean. Prashant, your thoughts? Oh, absolutely. My, my plan is to go visit. Uh, Lal Bhat Ka Raja. Same here. Uh, so I think that's going to take yeah. the entire weekend because that's how long the lines are. <laughs> Wear your masks, guys. Wear yeah, your we'll masks, we'll alright? And enjoy the festivities, of course. Sir. And you folks, join us yet again Monday morning, bright and early. Until then, enjoy your weekend.